Following World War I, Poland regained independence and Józef Piłsudski, a Polish revolutionary, emerged as a prominent figure. Piłsudski envisioned the creation of the Miedza Morza, also known as the Intermarium, a federation of Eastern European nations that would ensure their collective independence from Russia and Germany. Poland faced numerous challenges, including many wars to ensure their borders and their survival. These included the Polish-Ukrainian War, which lasted from November 1918 to July 1919, the Greater Poland Uprising from December 1918 to June 1919 saw the return of the Polish Corridor. The Polish Czechoslovak War in January 19 resulted in the division of Slaz Czesinski between Poland and Czechoslovakia. Additionally, the Silesian uprisings between August 1919 and July 1921 saw ethnic Poles in Silesia defeat German forces and secure parts of the region for Poland. However, the most remarkable chapter was the Polish Soviet War which unfolded from October 1920 to March 1921. As the Russian Civil War raged on, Poland seized the opportunity to reclaim historic Polish lands from Russia. The Soviet forces attacked and pushed all the way to Warsaw. In a miraculous turn of events, Osudzki's leadership enabled the Polish army to defeat the Soviets, ultimately saving not only Poland, but the rest of Europe from communism. Despite Poszutski's efforts, political enemies within Poland negotiated with the Soviets leading to the abandonment of the Intermarium, as well as Ukraine and Belarus falling under communist rule. Poland endured political turmoil until Polsuski's military coup in 1926, during which he aimed to rebuild and streamline the country. However, his reign ended with his death in 1935. The Second Polish Republic faced economic challenges, but achieved stability with the introduction of a new currency in 1924. Despite trade issues with Germany and the Soviet Union, Poland's economy continued to grow, the Polish had a strong military, but faced limitations and outdated leadership. Germany and the Soviet Union posed threats to Poland as they rapidly grew in power. The Fuhrer's rise and revanchist policies, along with Stalin's ambition to spread communism, targeted Poland. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, signed between Germany and the Soviet Union in 1939, led to their joint invasion of Poland, resulting in its annexation and division between the invaders and the end of the Second Polish Republic. Before we jump in, don't forget to like the video, hit the subscribe button, and the notification bell to stay updated with our historical adventures. Now, back to the video. Miedza Morza was Poland and Eastern Europe's best chance for survival, offering strengthened economies and militaries while deterring potential German or Soviet attacks. However, the alliance faced numerous challenges, including diverse interests, historical grievances, conflicting relationships with neighboring powers, and influences from Russia and Germany. Internal divisions and lack of international support weaken its prospects. In an altered timeline, Poland's success lies in a stronger victory against the Soviet Union, expanding its territorial control and gaining influence over the liberated nations. This resulted in Eastern Europe recognizing the importance of unity in the face of a shared security concerns, pulling their resources and coordinating defensive efforts. Economic cooperation and trade further enhanced their strength and fostered closer cooperation. The Intermarium became a symbol of freedom and a bulwark against aggression. The Intermarium, comprising initially Poland, the Baltics, Belarus, and Ukraine, emerged in 1923, with a unique system of governance that combined a strong central government with local autonomy. The Federation's Parliament, the Siam, elected a leader and set federal objectives, while France and England provided support, particularly in military technology and defense strategy, and the Ukrainians managed to convince the French to push the Maginot to the Atlantic. Amid Germany's growing power, Poland recognized Czechoslovakia's military and economic strength, leading to friendly relations between the two nations. Hungary, Poland's historical ally, also formed friendly ties. In 1927, the Treaty of Vesegrad was signed, bringing Czechoslovakia and Hungary into the Intermarium, with Poland ceding lands in Silesia to Czechoslovakia. Although the Federation initially faced challenges, it quickly modernized. Taking advantage of political instability in Romania, Hungary orchestrated a full-scale revolt in 1931, resulting in Romania ceding land to Hungary and Poland. This established a pro-Intermarian monarchy under Michael I and granted the Federation access to Romanian oil reserves, and Romania joined the Miedza Morza. Yugoslavia closely aligned with the Intermarium through various pacts and agreements, while the Federation fortified its borders with extensive defenses and natural barriers. Lithuania integrated into Poland in 1932, and free movement throughout the Federation was allowed by 1933. Despite plans for a coordinated invasion of Germany with France after the German rearmament, 
the Intermarium was not yet in a position to execute such an action. The Intermarium's economy experienced rapid growth by 1936, becoming the largest in Europe. Fueled by industrialization, the development of rail networks, and contributions from Jewish refugees, its military emerged as a formidable force, integrating various allied nations and benefiting from the knowledge of expelled Jewish scientists and engineers. The Federation boasted over 2 million troops and a strong air force. Here, the Soviet Union found itself engaged in a lengthy civil war, leaving the country weakened with the struggling economy. Concerned about the Intermarium's ambitions of reclaiming historic Russian lands, the Soviets sent numerous revolutionaries into the Federation, but these attempts were unsuccessful. Germany, under the NSDAP and the Führer, still experienced a rise in power and initiated rearmament. Recognizing the threat posed by the Intermarium, Germany formed an alliance with Mussolini sooner than in her own timeline, mobilizing their forces and economies earlier. Austria faced a complex question over its future. Hit hard by the Great Depression, Austria experienced a civil war in 1934 in February, resulting in a victory for the right-wing Austrians led by Chancellor Engelbert Tufos. To unite Austria under the Fatherland Front and prevent annexation by Germany, Austria turned to the Intermarium for protection. The Treaty of Budapest was signed in September 1936, solidifying their alliance. However, Germany, angered by this, began to move to annex Austria and catch the Intermarium by surprise. In 1939, they blitzed their way through the nation and took Vienna, while the Austrian government fled to Warsaw, organizing resistance for the war. The Intermarium had fortified its defenses, but Germany doubted the Federation's strength, and was emboldened by Britain's policy of appeasement and Poland's failure to defend the Austrians. Yugoslavia feared a German invasion and sought protection from the Federation, and rushed to join. Mussolini remained neutral, acknowledging the strength of France and Yugoslavia. Unbeknownst to the world, Germany and the Soviet Union signed a secret treaty forming the Berlin-Moscow Axis. World War II had begun with the Allies, the Intermarium, the United Kingdom, and France, facing off against the Axis powers led by Germany and the Soviet Union. The Führer launched a large-scale invasion aiming to conquer the Mids of Morgia and simultaneously challenged France in the West. France and Britain swiftly mobilized their forces, recognizing the gravity of the impending conflict. The world anxiously awaited the monumental clash that would determine the fate of the globe. Germany's initial advances into Poland were met with strong resistance from the fortified defenses. The German Blitzkrieg strategy faltered, while rebel groups supported by Hungarian and Romanian troops seized the eastern regions of Austria. After a six-week siege, Vienna fell to the Federation, inflicting heavy casualties on the German forces. Germany retreated to fortified positions in Austria, and Yugoslavia pushed further in. This defeat proved to be a humiliating setback for Germany, adding any hope of advancement into the Balkans. Mussolini committed to neutrality, believing the Germans to be doomed, as he was unaware of their Soviet alliance. The Intermarium forces held their ground in Czechoslovak mountain forts, causing heavy losses for the Germans. Despite setbacks, Germany believed the Federation would collapse. Two months after Germany's invasion of Poland, the Soviet Union invaded Ukraine. This surprise caught the Mieds of Morgia off guard, and the Soviets occupied swaths of land. These events put a massive strain on the Intermarium. The United Kingdom and France, despite their support, believed the Federation would fall within two years. On the other hand, Germany and the Soviet Union remained confident they could force the Intermarium's capitulation by 1940. While Germany managed to seize some land in western Poland, they failed to capture any major cities. The Soviet push in the east, particularly toward the Genopir River, ended in defeat after an eight-month loss at Kiev. The toll was heavy, with two million Soviet casualties and around 300 Ukrainians lost. In addition, the Axis launched attacks into Belarus and the Baltics. Meanwhile, the Winter War between Finland and the Soviet Union failed to commence as the Soviets were preoccupied with their operations in Eastern Europe. However, the Finns feared a Soviet attack and joined the Allies. The Baltic region became a battleground, with Estonia successfully resisting the Soviet invasion, resulting in immense casualties on both sides. In 1940, the Eastern Front witnessed significant developments as the Soviet Union advance across Belarus was halted at Vidbysk, resulting in heavy losses. Meanwhile, the Soviets sought to conquer Estonia to control the Baltic and cut off Finland from the Intermarium. However, the Estonian resistance proved formidable, leading to a brutal stalemate and substantial casualties. In Ukraine, the Edzimorzha forces launched a successful counterattack, recapturing key cities and inflicting heavy losses on the Soviets. Bulgaria, Greece, and Albania joined the Allies, strengthening the coalition against the Axis. 
On the Western Front, Germany made advances into Poland, seized in Poznan, Bydgoszcz, and Gdynia, and connected their land to Konigsberg. However, their invasion into France turned into a disaster as the French and British forces effectively defended their positions. Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg quickly fell, but with the Maginot Line, the Allies kept them at the Belgian border. Despite failing to obliterate France, Germany continued their offensive. Back in Prussia, several cities were captured by the Poles as they were pushed to the Baltic. Meanwhile, they were rebuffed at Katowice, a major city for the intramural steel manufacturing, and the Slovaks captured Gleiwitz. In the south, the situation stabilized as both sides controlled different parts of Austria and the Danube. Klagenfurt fell to the Yugoslavians by August, and the Austrian nationalists cheered as the Germans retreated. Linz and Graz also fell to the Hungaro Polish army by September. German forces were relegated to the Alps and Salzburg was besieged, but maintained steady supplies. The Czechs easily maintained their defenses against the German onslaught. Italy, refraining from joining the war directly, provided limited aid to the Germans. By the year's end, Germany had suffered heavy losses, losing over 500,000 troops since the beginning of the invasion, and their grip on the war began to crumble under mounting challenges. In 1941, the German advance into France was completely halted by the Anglo-French armies, resulting in heavy casualties. The French strategy of thinning their forces and undermining Germany's economy had a debilitating effect on the German war machine. On the Eastern Front, Polish forces launched a major offensive against the Germans in the north. The city of Konigsberg became a disaster for the Germans, and during a prolonged siege and intense bombings. Eventually, the city fell, inflicting significant losses on the German side. Luckily, major historic buildings had been spared, though. In the southern regions, Czech forces had successfully defended against the German attacks and even made territorial gains, capturing several cities, including Dresden, shocking the Reich. Schusnig returned to Austria and began rebuilding his military and pushed the Germans out of the Alps, proclaiming control and becoming free from German influence. Plans were made to incorporate Catholic Bavaria into a greater Austrian state. Meanwhile, the Soviets faced deteriorating conditions in the east. The Federation's forces defended their territories and inflicted heavy casualties on the Soviets. Despite massive losses, the Soviets made little progress in their attacks. In Belarus, Emir Zamorzha secured a crucial victory at Smolensk, further weakening the Soviets, while another army had pushed westward to capture Bryansk, Kursk, and Orel. Ukrainian troops advanced into Russia and conquered Rostov and Luhansk, moving closer to Stalingrad. The Battle of Stalingrad became a turning point in the conflict, involving combined forces from the entire Mietze Morsh. The battle, lasting from May to November, resulted in a devastating defeat for the Soviets, with around 800,000 soldiers lost. This victory severely crippled the Soviets and led to anti-Soviet uprisings in Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, resulting in declarations of independence from Russia. It's worth mentioning that Japan bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, but they were not aligned with the Axis powers here. As a result, the United States focused its efforts on the Pacific Front, which we will get into later. 1942 witnessed significant setbacks for the Soviets, as they suffered losses at Krasnodar, Stravopol, Rojanikita, and Grozny. The remaining Soviet forces fled to Ostrakhan, which also fell after a six-month siege in September, leaving the Caucasus free. In Belarus, their army pushed north and captured Tula and Ryazan by April, advancing toward Moscow with an army of over 600,000 men. On the Baltic front, Emir Zimorzha embarked on a successful offensive, securing Novgorod. The Finnish forces joined the war and encountered minimal resistance and captured Karelia. Their army then set its sights on Leningrad. The siege of Leningrad commenced in June 1942. Assisted by the Finns, the Federation launched a relentless assault on the city, which held immense industrial significance for the Soviets. However, despite significant losses on both sides, the year-long siege yielded minimal gains, leaving the situation in a tense stalemate. Simultaneously, the siege of Moscow unfolded. In June, the Belarusian army, reinforced by the entire Intramurium, initiated an offensive. They bombarded the city with crucial support from the Polish Air Force. Soviet counterattacks in August were thwarted by the Hungarians. Moscow finally fell in November, resulting in the death of 310,000 Russians and capturing 600,000 more. Only a fraction of the prisoners made it to the camps, leaving the Soviet with a single major city on the brink of collapse. Shifting focus to the Western Front, the Germans faced an imminent defeat. The British and French forces broke through their lines in the Benelux countries. 
Luxembourg was liberated by April, and the Allies advanced further, capturing Ghent, Liege, Brussels, and Antwerp by November. Substantial portions of the Netherlands were freed, with Eindhoven and Rotterdam coming under Allied control. The Polish-Lithuanian army achieved a major victory at the Battle of Danzig in April, resulting in 84,000 German deaths and a near-total destruction of the city. Polish forces continued their offensive, reclaiming Bydgoszcz and Poznan by July. Descent among German troops grew as the Wehrmacht turned against the SS. Intermarian forces advanced, capturing Breslau, Lignitz, and Frankfurt. Frankfurt's fall in November marked the Fuhrer's self-inflicted demise. Henning von Tresco, the mastermind of Operation Valkyrie in real life, was appointed provisional head of state by the Wehrmacht provisional government. The Czech offensive continued, bombarding Leipzig for three months with Polish Air Force support. The city surrendered in July, causing over 1,800 civilian casualties and widespread destruction. The Czechs also captured Erfurt. An agreement was reached between the Intermarium and Tresco. The Wehrmacht pledged to eliminate the remaining SS troops and accept Germany's partition. Germany agreed to cede territory to pay minor reparations, while the Polish would halt bombings on non-military targets. German citizens would be treated humanely and civilian property preserved. Poland vowed to support for Germany's reconstruction through military alliance and economic cooperation, with the prospect of a German entry into the Intermarium. The Treaty of Kalisz was signed on July 8, 1942, formalizing these agreements. The Czech forces pressed on, capturing Nuremberg from the SS. Combined forces from Austria, Hungary, and Romania made strides. Munich fell swiftly, and Augsburg surrendered after heavy bombardment. Austria finally joined the Intermarium in November. The collapsing fascist Germans faced a leadership vacuum, while the Allies regained control over the Netherlands and pushed deeper into Germany. In 1943, the relentless advance of the Allies gradually forced the SS to abandon their cause, facing mounting losses and dwindling morale. The British continued their strategic bombing campaign, targeting SS manufacturing facilities to disrupt the German war effort. These persistent air raids not only disrupted production, but also instilled fear and confusion among the German population. In March, the advancing Allied forces captured the historic stronghold of Aachen. This triumph provided a significant boost for the Allies' momentum and served as a stepping stone for further offensive. Simultaneously, French forces launched an assault across the Maginot. They swiftly gained control of German-occupied territories and advanced toward the Rhine River. By June, the combined efforts of the Allied armies resulted in the capture of major German cities, including Freiburg, Mannheim, Mainz, Cologne, Dusseldorf, Essen, Dortmund, and Oldenburg. The intense battles led to a loss of numerous SS lives, while many German soldiers, faced with the overwhelming odds, chose to surrender. Meanwhile, on the Eastern Front, Austria and Poland made significant strides into the German heartland. Assisted by Wehrmacht troops, he launched a powerful offensive. These combined forces successfully captured the cities of Stuttgart and Würzburg, doing significant blows to the German defenses. Poland, with support from Wehrmacht troops, advanced relentlessly and encircled Berlin, the last major stronghold of the SS. Initiating a relentless bombing campaign, the Poles subjected the city to intense aerial bombardment for months, inflicting heavy damage on military and civilian infrastructure. While Berlin held out, Polish and Lithuanian forces continued their westward push, reaching the Elbe River. Their gains allowed for the strategic connection of territories, strengthening the Intermarium's position. Pushing further westward, they reached Hanover, tightening their grip on the remnants of the fascist German forces. Finally, on October 18th, the remaining SS forces surrendered, bringing an end to their resistance. With their defeat, the Wehrmacht troops swiftly redirected their focus to the ongoing conflict against the Soviet Union on the Eastern Front. The Intermarium seized the opportunity of Germany's occupation to convene the Luxembourg Peace Conference, uniting France, Britain, and the remaining German government represented by the Wehrmacht. Their primary goal was to secure France and Britain's commitment to combat the Soviet Union, recognizing communism as the greatest threat to European stability. Winston Churchill strongly supported this approach, advocating for the complete eradication of the Bolsheviks. Following a similar approach to Churchill's plans, Germany was divided into separate nations to prevent any resurgence of a unified German state. The Commonwealth of Hanover-Westphalia, under French influence, emerged as a dominant industrial entity. Austria annexed lands up to the Main River, 
forming the Catholic Republic of Austria Bavaria. This Catholic German state arguably gained the most from the war within the Interregnum. However, the Federal Republic of Prussia emerged as the most significant nation from the division of Germany. While this may sound inconceivable, Churchill proposed a revived Prussia to Roosevelt and Stalin in real life. Led by Chancellor Tresco, the newly formed Prussian state became a puppet state of Poland-Lithuania. Acknowledging Prussia's rejection of the former fascist German government, the Mietz and Morgia treated this new German entity honorably, avoiding further conflicts. To prevent Prussia from becoming antagonistic or feeling cheated, Poland-Lithuania granted them part of the Polish corridor, while allowing them to retain some historic Prussian lands. Although Prussia lost most of its territory to Poland, Konigsberg was returned to them, serving as their capital once more. Berlin remained a unified city, symbolizing unity and reconstruction efforts supported by the Intermarium. The revival of the Prussian identity aimed to limit the resurgence of strong German nationalism that could lead to aggressive expansionist ideologies and threaten regional stability. Poland-Lithuania sought to reinvigorate the old Prussian beliefs, separating Prussia's historic legacy from the negative associations of German nationalism and fascism. Recognizing Prussian identity as a distinct one from German identity, Poland emphasized the differences between the two, promoting reconciliation and creating a new narrative beyond the destructive aspects of German identity. Poland aimed to rebuild a new political and cultural order in the region by fostering cooperation between Polish and Prussian populations. This involved redefining boundaries, promoting regional cohesion, and allowing for civil pride. Poland-Lithuania also sought a strong German ally in Prussia for future strategic advances in any potential conflicts with France and the UK, who had appeared to grow weary of the Mietze Morzha's rapid rise to power. Reviving Prussian identity into the Federal Republic of Prussia had multiple purposes, limiting German nationalism, promoting reconciliation, establishing a new order, and ensuring regional stability within the Intermarium. It aimed to integrate Germans on a global scale while providing Poland-Lithuania with the strategic edge. Territorial changes resulting from the Luxembourg Peace Conference included the Netherlands expanding to the Ems River, Belgium gaining minor borderland near Aachen, France securing Saarland, Poland-Lithuania obtaining land up to the Odra River and a small part of the Konigsberg territory, and Czechoslovakia acquiring territories extending to the Danube River and the north. During the Luxembourg Conference, the Eastern Front of World War II reached a critical turning point. The Intermarium fiercely clashed with the Soviet Union, resulting in staggering casualties. Approximately 800,000 Intermarium soldiers lost their lives, while the Soviet Union suffered around 3 million fatalities. The intense fighting left a devastating impact on the landscape. By the year's end, the Allies achieved significant victories, weakening the Soviet Union's hold on key cities. Leningrad fell after a prolonged siege, opening up new possibilities for Eastern Europe. The Federation had now captured the three most important Soviet cities and gained control over the oil-rich Caucasus region, depriving the Soviets of crucial resources. Stalin faced dissent and was eventually assassinated, leading to a further disarray within the Soviet ranks. Despite setbacks, the Soviet Union regrouped and planned a strategic retreat to Siberia, aiming to exhaust the Intermarium through a war of attrition. As the Eastern Front entered this crucial phase, both sides prepared for the challenges and sacrifices in the unforgiving landscapes of Siberia. In 1944, the declining popularity of the Soviet government allowed Allied forces to advance quickly into Russian territory, gaining control of all land west of the Ural Mountains. The capture of these key cities resulted in widespread destruction and suffering for the millions of Russians. The Soviets resisted fiercely through guerrilla warfare, inflicting heavy casualties. Defections and civil wars weakened their resolve signaling the imminent collapse of the Soviet Union within the next five years. In the Pacific Front, the United States redirected a significant air force to bomb Japanese cities while focusing more troops on the Pacific instead of Europe here. Furthermore, the lend system, which provided war supplies to nations vital for the U.S. defense, favored nationalist China in this altered timeline. Instead of the Soviet Union and the U.K. receiving the majority of aid, China became the primary beneficiary, receiving approximately $40 billion. Equipped with modern supplies and equipment, nationalist China effectively resisted and defeated the outnumbered Japanese armies. Due to increased American submarine presence, Japan's shipping and transportation were disrupted, weakening their ability to wage war. As a result, Japan collapsed earlier than in real life. American aid also ensured the victory of Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist forces in China, preventing the rise of the Communist Party. China became the significant ally of the United States, altering Asian politics and avoiding the Korean and Vietnam Wars. 
On December 26, 1949, the Soviet Union finally surrendered to the Allies, leading to the worldwide eradication of communism. China's contributions and aid played a crucial role in this outcome. World War II resulted in immense loss of life and extensive devastation across Europe and Asia, forever changing global politics and alliances. After intense negotiations, the borders of Eastern Europe were finally determined through the Budapest Agreement. The fate of Russia was a significant concern, especially for the Mianza Morzhin, which had endured the majority of the fighting against the Soviets and feared the possibility of Russia regrouping and having future conflicts. Similar to their approach with Germany, the Intermarium nations advocated for the division of Russia into separate entities. By this point, Russia had joined the Intermarium and experienced significant prosperity. Federation's economic support had allowed them to quickly rebuild. Military and industrial capabilities quickly grew. They rejected a nationalistic German identity and viewed themselves as a successor of the old Prussian kingdom. Ukrainians and Belarusians hoped for a similar outcome in Russia. As a result, Russia was divided into four distinct nations. The Confederation of Russian states encompassed the core territories, including Moscow and the central Russian oblast. It represented the primary Russian state, but did not join the Intermarium, instead being a loose Belarusian puppet. The Republic of Novgorod, this long-standing rivalry with Moscow, emerged as a separate nation, aligned with the Intermarium as a Polish puppet state. It retained a level of autonomy within the Confederation. The Volgograd Commonwealth, historically connected to Ukraine, became a Ukrainian puppet state and entered into the Intermarium. China took advantage of the situation and annexed lands in eastern Russia and Mongolia, expanding its influence and territories. They also controlled the newly formed Siberian Republic as a puppet. Additionally, several states gained independence from Russia, including Kuban, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia as Ukrainian puppet states, and Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan as independent nations in Central Asia. However, they quickly fell under China's dominance. Ukraine extended its border to the Don River. Belarus acquired significant territories in the east, and Estonia and Latvia experienced minor expansions. Finland seized the opportunity and annexed Karelia. With the completion of the Budapest Agreement, the Mianza Warsaw transformed into a genuinely multinational entity, including Poland, Lithuania, Prussia, Czechoslovakia, Austria, Bavaria, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Romania, Ukraine, Volgograd, Novgorod, Belarus, Latvia, and Estonia. The Intermarium aimed to foster stability, cooperation, and reconciliation among its member states and the wider European region as a whole. Despite the tense negotiations and recent scars of war, there is hope that this multinational federation would lead to a prosperous and peaceful future for all its members. Poland and the Intermarium had indeed reshaped Europe in profound ways. Their collective efforts directly and indirectly toppled the oppressive regimes of fascist Germany, the Soviets, and the People's Republic of China. By standing strong and united, the Intermarium demonstrated that peace, unity, and cooperation among nations were not only possible, but crucial for a better future. Europe and the world faced a new reality shaped by the Intermarium vision, focusing on reconstruction, industrial revitalization, and policies for stability and prosperity. As the dust settled, the future of the Intermarium remained uncertain, but the shared spirit, determination, and values of its member nations pointed to a promising path ahead, stealing hope for a better and more prosperous tomorrow. Share your thoughts in the comment section below. I'm eager to hear your insights. If we reach 4,000 likes in the video, I'll release a part 2 to explore the outcomes further. Please let me know any topic ideas you want me to cover in the future. If you're interested in my sources and more, please consider supporting me on Patreon or becoming a channel member. Please leave a like and subscribe as it helps immensely. Until next time fellow history enthusiasts, goodbye.